we've been looking for how to put together, you know, sort of a continuation of last year's conference that really uh, tied together a lot of these ideas of of change and where change, you know, change that's happening to us and where change is going. And um, we were um, meeting with with a uh, a local official recently. It wasn't that recently; it was a, a few months ago. And and he said to us, "Have you ever heard of Ed Morrison?" And 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 uh, of course, immediately I got my I have my phone out and I'm searching. And um, and he says, "You know, you guys you guys do some really interesting work." And I and I'm, at this point, I'm saying, "Ah, strategic doing." There's a name for what we do, which I thought was really cool. So we got in contact with Ed, and he, of course, gave the keynote yesterday. Um, if you did not see the keynote yesterday, I'm sorry. Uh, we will have it on video, but there's nothing like getting your socks knocked off in person. <laughs> um, so the, you know, watch for the video coming out. We'll, we'll post a link to it. Uh, you, you really want to see that. You probably want to watch it again if you did see it yesterday. And then as we um, started thinking about what we're doing with this conference, we began thinking about this idea of the world of 3.0. Uh, where are we going in the future? And the kinds of changes that are occurring to us all around. And we did some searching. We went out and we're, we're searching world of 3.0. And guess what popped up? Our, our keynote today. So Jeff Borden talks about education 3.0. And uh, this is a really interesting concept. As you can see on the board, he's a neuroscience guy. All right, he, he talks, he understands how the brain learns. And, um, and he's, gonna, he's gonna make some very interesting compares and contrast here. So we actually have a video linked if you go to the sparkgrowth.net website and look at the, the Friday agenda and look at his panel, there's a video link there. Watch that video you'll get your socks knocked off again. But I think he's going to do something here in person, which is really cool. So that's called Better Learning Through Technology. Really nice video. So Jeff is a teacher and a professor. Or he's, a, he's a natural at this. He's an education consultant. He has spoken in front of Congress for the uh, Secretary of Education. Uh, he travels the world talking to educators about education. In fact, he was just telling me he's already, he's already logged 60,000 miles in the last six weeks. He was in Texas right before this, oh, Iowa before that. He was in Vietnam a couple weeks ago, and he's going, gosh knows where next. <laughs> so he, he's, he's going to be getting on a plane. And he also blogs for Wired. So he, I'm going to let Jeff introduce himself and um, tell us about Education 3.0. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh, I also like to point out I was president of my sixth grade class two times. So, all right. Wow, all right. It's morning. It's morning. We're going. Um, I go around the world talking to people about education, talking about technology, about how technology can infuse itself into the educational conversation. And often I come up against people who say there are things you cannot use technology to teach. You cannot use technology to teach medicine or gym class or art. All of these things, by the way, are being taught online. But when I start to ask some questions, like why can't you teach art online? Why can't you use technology in an educational setting to teach art? Uh, I had an art teacher say to me, it's because you cannot teach perspective. Well, I, I wasn't sure that I bought into that, so I went out and did a little bit of looking. This is called Sketch of a Woman from the Inside Out. It was developed by a Brazilian painter who wanted to begin to teach perspective. So using flash technology, which was not necessarily readily available 10 or 20 years ago, but is ubiquitous today, he is putting together a human being by which to teach perspective. He is assembling the skeleton, then he will wrap around that skin and then hair and then clothing. He is building a person to start to teach at a distance the concept of perspective. We can do so much more today than we even dreamed about 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, in terms of connection, in terms of integration, in terms of all the things that we now know that our brains need in order to learn best, we can begin to do that. I'm gonna apologize now, I'm gonna turn this off. I know you'd like to see it finish. Uh, sketch of a woman from the inside out, you can Google it and find it, but I'll also make sure the PowerPoint is available to you today, okay? I wanna talk about how this stuff leads to success. 
A lot of people think about different things when they think of success, especially academic success, my world, uh, trying to figure out how a student is going to be successful in their college experience, for example. And so as they talk about success, they will uh, often point to certain markers. They'll say it's all about a test score. If you know what someone got on a certain test, then that will tell you how successful they will be in their college experience. Some people say, no, it's about family. You may know the research that suggests that a person will not go further in their education than their parents did. That if they have a parent who got a, a, an undergraduate, they will likely get an undergraduate, et cetera. Then there are folks who say, no, 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 it's about grades or GPA or some of those things. Well, there are a lot more elements of success that we now are starting to talk about. The University of Pennsylvania, for example, has come out with some research recently about grit, tenacity, perseverance. And they would suggest that you will be successful if you have those markers, if you have those indicators, that you can actually overcome the hurdles of, of education that are often dropped in your way. I'd like to show you another measure of success based on some brain science that we now know to be effective in certain contexts. I want to actually give you an inventory. So you're gonna to need to write down your score. I'm gonna give you 10 things to uh, associate with yourself, 10 criteria. And I want you to take this inventory and see where you fit on my scale for this element of success, which I'll talk about in a second, all right? Now let me show you the first measure of the inventory so you know what, what we're going to do. The first uh, measure is this. I rarely plan ahead. I'm a spur of the moment kind of person. If that completely applies to you, then I'd like you to give yourself a three. If that does not apply to you at all, then give yourself a zero. Or somewhere in between, if you think, well, I'm kind of spur of the moment or I'm mostly spur of the moment, then you might go with a one or a two, okay? So it, it completely applies to you as a three, it does not apply to you at all, is a zero. There are 10 of these. I would like you to score yourself for all 10 Add up your score so that you get a cumulative total. I'm going to give you just a few moments to do this. Go ahead and, and score yourself on this inventory. Zero means it does not apply to you at all. I can usually tell when people get to the cheating on your partner line as there's some uncomfortable smiles and looking around. <laughs> I'll give you just another couple of moments to finish this up. Remember, please tally your score. All right, as you determine success based on this inventory, as you add these scores up, let me show you the scale by which these things are measured, all right? So after you have your total score, here's the, the final scale that we're looking for is this. If you were a zero to 10, that would be considered low. If you were 26 to 30, that would be considered very high on this particular indicator. And what you have just done is you have helped determine where you fit on the psychopathy scale. <laughs> Whether or not you are a psychopath, all right? Now you'll notice I did not have you share your answers with each other, I don't want anyone running from the room. Uh, but while that, this by the way is a completely real inventory, this is true, but let me tell you this is not a gimmick and this is not a trick. This particular scale has been studied by various researchers. There's a man on the West Coast named John Fa James Fallon who has been taking a look at MRIs. He can tell you if a person is a psychopath based on the look of their brain in an MRI machine. They have certain parts of the brain that are lesser than others. They have certain parts of the brain that are missing. He can actually tell you a person who is a psychopath based solely on the look of their brain. 
At the same time, on the east coast of Columbia, Kevin Dutton and some other researchers have done some interesting uh, uh, research around psychopaths in society. There are people who fit along the continuum of psychopathy, and they tend to make it better as CEOs. I think I have a room full of CEOs here. They uh, make better neurosurgeons. They make better Tibetan monks. I don't know why. Something about no empathy, I think, in that case. But there are certain segments of society in which the wisdom of psychopaths becomes important. They can do things other people cannot. We know more about the brain than we have ever known before. And I want to try to talk to you about some of the implications of that within the educational context today. At the same time, I'm going to talk about how education technology really does lay out a nice foundation for these things as we move forward. Now, if you're going to ask me, in terms of education technology, who I am, this would be my technological resume. This is my Wordle. If you're not familiar with Wordle.net, it's this cool little word cloud tool that you put in a paragraph of text. The words that are used the most are the biggest. The words that are used the least are the smallest. So this would be my Wordle. I am a communications and rhetoric professor. I work uh, as a vice president of instruction and academic strategy at Pearson. I run a research center. It's just a think tank for uh, academic research. Those are the professional things I do. But you might also see up there, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I, I, we own a dog named Doug. My, my daughter loved the movie Up. So as, as you start to assemble all of these things, you start to see who this person is in front of you. But it's really not until you put it into a meaningful pattern that you get a decent sense of this guy that's standing up here before you. Well, what I want to do is I want to try to talk about what I like to call the C's of education. And there are a lot of them. Critical thinking, creativity, curriculum, content, uh, all of these different C's that we have around computer literacy and constructivism. As we start to assemble these, I want to see if I can't help you put them in a little bit more meaningful pattern so that by the time we're done today, we are navigating those C's of education, sorry for the really bad pun, so that we have this pattern that helps us move forward as we go, all right? I'm gonna do that by talking about a concept that I call Education 3.0. It is the confluence of neuroscience, learning research, and education technology, as that education technology helps us deliver at scale the ability that, that, that we know we need for students to learn best. That's really what we're after. And so to that end, I'm gonna talk about those three facets of education as we jump into Education 3.0. I'm gonna start way back in 1992. When I first began my educational career as an instructor, I, was, uh, I got my first graduate assistantship at the University of Northern Colorado, and I had my first class. And I was asked over and over again by my mentors and my professors a certain question that I was told to sort of interject that into my framework for how I taught. Now, if you don't remember 1992, just to remind you, Nick Nolte was the sexiest man alive. I have no idea why, really no idea. But here's the question that I was asked and told to use as I framed my teaching experience. What's the best way to teach and what's the best way to test? No matter how many students you have, what's the best way to do those two things, to teach and to test? And while I don't think it was the best question that we could have asked, it was the best one that we knew at the time because that was based on the tradition of education, what we had done for decades, if not centuries. We had done this for almost a thousand years now in terms of how we give information, pass along information, and then measure information coming back. That was what we were asking. Now, to that end, we didn't really ask much about the learner. We asked much more about the professor, about the teacher. And I think that that's a problem. And I want to try to illustrate that with uh, something that we know about sobriety. In fact, in just a moment, I'm going to see how at risk or how risk averse you are. I'm going to ask you to participate with me. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. In just a moment, I'm going to have you stand. When you stand, I'm going to have you take your arms and place them facing the two walls on either side. I'm going to ask you to put your head back and close your eyes. Then I'm going to ask you to lift one leg. And your job is to stand on one leg as I count to 10. If at any point you have to put your leg down, I would like you to sit. 
Okay? So only the people at the end who will remain standing are those that have been able to stand the whole time on one leg. Okay? Everybody understand? Please stand up. Put your hands facing those walls. Head back, eyes closed. Raise your leg. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, if you're still standing, stay standing. Give these guys a round of applause. Nicely done. Nicely done. All right, have a seat. Have a seat. This test of sobriety is 93% accurate. You can have a seat. It's 93% accurate. But I have a, so I, have, I therefore have a question for you. How much have you guys had to drink this morning? <laughs> Most of the room looked drunk. Why is that? I can tell you why that is. The reason is it has to do with sleep and REM cycles. When a person is awoken during a REM cycle, when you force yourself awake through the use of an alarm clock, then it actually cognitively impairs you for the majority of the morning, sometimes the entire day, to the point of having a 0.10 blood alcohol content. You are cognitively impaired when you force yourself to wake up, instead of waking up naturally and just experiencing morning as you do, when you force yourself with an alarm clock for several hours, if not the whole day, you are cognitively impaired. How does that translate to learners? I can't tell you how many 8 a.m. classes I was forced to take during my college program and how many 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. classes we still have today that are packed in with 200, 300, 400 students, even though the majority of them have the cognitive ability of a person with a 0.10 blood alcohol content and we expect them to learn. We know more about the brain than we have ever known before. In fact, I want to speak to the learner, some of the stuff we started to figure out about the learner, right around that 1992 range. In fact, just a couple years before that, Richard Light at Harvard began doing an assessment series. And this assessment series was, it was fantastic in terms of its results. He interviewed 1,600 students all up and down the Northeast. And he asked them a 24-page interview guide, two to three hour interview. Uh, there were lots of different people who did the interview. It was really quite remarkable, but the findings were amazing. Now remember, these students are community college students, technology uh, students, they are R1s and Ivy Leagues, they're all over the place. But he asked them some really important questions about their educational experience. And what he found should make an impact in what we do on a regular basis. Let me see if I can give you just a few of the findings. First of all, he found that choice matters in terms of motivation. Motivation we all know is important, but choice and the empowerment that comes from choice really does make a difference. Here's how he found that out. The very first question on the, on the inventory, he asked students to rate their academic experience. Now think about that to, to yourself for just a moment. If you could rate your undergraduate experience, what would you give it on a scale of one to 10? 10 is the highest, one is the lowest. When those students were asked that question, they answered it in essentially two groupings, two clusters. They had the sixes and sevens, and they had the eights and nines. Not a single student gave their experience a 10, but very few gave it a five or below. It was six or seven, eight or nine. Those were by far the two big, big clusters that they, they had. Now, they asked a second question right after that. And this question, while it wasn't at first intended to be a follow-up, turned into a follow-up because a correlation soon emerged. The second question that they then asked was, how did you first pick your classes when you got to school? How did you make the decision of what class to take and when? Interestingly, the group of sixes and sevens almost all said the same thing. They said, when I first got to college, I took the classes that I had to take. I got the junk out of the way so that I could concentrate on the fun stuff later. I did the general ed, I did the requirements, I did those things. Now, the Light and, and the other in interviews said, well, why did you do that? And they said, well, I got that advice. That advice was given to me by a professor or by an advisor or by my parent or by my sister or my brother. Somebody told me to do that, and so I did. 
Interestingly though, the students who had more satisfaction with their educational experiences, the eights or nines, said something different. When they were asked, how did you first pick your classes, they said, I took a class every semester that interested me. I did something along the way every term that I thought was fun or unique or engaging. Often, it didn't even have to do with their program. They just took it because it interested them. That's it. The empowerment of choice, when, when you give students the ability to make some choices and then allow them to use those choices, it really impacts their learning experience. You know what works in terms of choice? Games. Gamification is a powerful educational tool that most of us will not see or use in our lifetime. Gamification, it's, I, I was just talking to two experts, two people who run their own gaming companies. They have got research that guarantees learning will take place better in a game than it does inside the classroom. It requires the teacher to give up about 20 to 40 hours, depending on which game, gamer I was talking to, 20 to 40 hours of educational time, and students will come out of that gaming experience knowing more about math, sociology, and history than they would if they're sitting in a traditional classroom. And no school district will adopt it. You know why? Because the teachers give up control. The teachers say, I have to be the one that teach those students that, not a game. I'm not gonna play a game in my classroom, and I get it. I understand what, what happens with games. I want to play a game with you. I would like you, please, grab the hands of three or four people. Make a little cluster of three or four people. Grab their hands right now. Go ahead. Try it. All right. You guys are on a boat. Your boat is sinking. You have 30 seconds to determine who's going to get in the life raft and who gets in the water. And I guarantee whoever gets in the water is going to die. Your life raft will hold all of you but one. Who doesn't get in? Decide now. 30 seconds, go. Fifteen seconds. Time. OK. I would like for all of those who are going in the water to remain standing. Everybody else sit down. People going in the water, stand up. People who are in the raft, sit down. Give a round of applause to these people who have taken one for the team. Well done. All right, everybody have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. Now. Oh, so you're going to die one at a time. Perfect. Well done. Now, there is a problem with that game that we just played. The problem, I'm not even going to ask you for it. I'm just going to tell you what the problem is. It's stupid. Right? What we just did was stupid. You know we're not in water. You know you're not in a boat. So when I said, you've got to pick one person who's not going to make it in the life raft, they're going to, I, I guarantee there were people in this room who were like, whatever, I'll do it. <laughs> right? You don't care. Because there's no real threat or danger. Those are the kinds of games that we started playing in the 60s and 70s and called them uh, edutainment and said, hey, OK, we'll, we'll make them an object lesson. But those aren't terribly effective. That's not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about games, I'm talking about games like Fold It. Fold It is a game that was developed by researchers who could not figure out for 15 years how a protein replicated itself in the AIDS virus. They discovered it, and for 15 years, they had no idea how it replicated. They couldn't figure it out. Finally, after about 14 years, some, one of the researchers said, what if we turn this into a game and let people in the world crowdsource it? Maybe they could help us. So it took about a year of development. They used this, this company is actually called Fold It, but they created the game Fold It. They put it out on the web. Gamers figured it out in three weeks. 
three weeks they figured out how this protein replicates itself. They believe, researchers believe, this is the key to solving the AIDS crisis. That they will be able to fix the problem now that they know how it replicates. That's the kind of game I'm talking about. I'm talking about Enterzon. Enterzon is a game that was developed by Dr. Zhao at Michigan State. He is now at Oregon. He wanted to teach conversational Chinese. So he put people in a massive online role-playing game. You're dropped in the middle of virtual China wearing nothing but a t-shirt and shorts. You have to feed yourself. You have to clothe yourself. You have to find a job. You have to get shelter. And all of this is done by speaking Chinese over Skype, which is free. This game is free. People are learning Chinese three, four, and five times faster than when they're sitting in a classroom conjugating verbs. We know more about the brain than we have ever known before. We know more about the learner than we've ever known before. And Richard Light showed us that when you empower people through choices, games, by the way, are filled with choices, you get better learning. The second thing that Richard Light uh, came, oh, I'm sorry, let me, let me add this. John, John Seeley Brown, I, this, this, I just found this recently. John Seeley Brown came out last year with a great quote. He said uh, to the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, he said, I would rather hire a World of Warcraft guild master than a Harvard MBA. Now, Harvard didn't like that very much, and so they called John, said, John, come on, you went to Harvard. <laughs> what are you talking about? You've worked at NASA, you've worked as a physicist, you've done all these things, what, what do you mean? And he said, wait a minute, in World of Warcraft, those guild masters are hiring, they're firing, they're creating professional development, they're strategizing how they're going to go on their raids, they are doing all of the things in that environment that you're giving theoretically to the students in the MBA program. I want the person who's done it. Harvard, by the way, said, John, it would never happen. No one would hire a gamer over someone with an MBA. And John Seeley Brown said, what about Yahoo? That was exactly what they did when they hired the man who took them into the year 2000 back in the 90s. He was in, still, by this day, uh, by Yahoo standards, considered the best president they've ever had. And Harvard said, oh, right. Click. <laughs> <laughs> Games work. Choice matters. The second thing that Richard Light found that I want to talk about today is the importance of social learning. Social learning is very important for our lives. Uh, this really came to light when science departments at uh, all of these different colleges said, Richard, could you put something into the, the survey that asks why students are staying science majors? Because they had a problem. Only 55% of the time did a person start as a science major and end as a science major. That's, a not, that's not a very good number for program retention. All right? They said, we, we want to know what's going on. We want to try to fix that. The answer to the question, why did you stay a science major, the single answer changed the game for those science departments to the point where they actually moved the needle eight points. By 2000, when this was done, they had an 8% jump in people who were staying science majors. When students were asked, why did you stay a science major, the answer that they gave over and over again was very simple. They said it was because I joined a study group. They joined another group of people who were talking about science. Now, if you know what a study group entails, it entails teaching at times. We all know when you teach something, you learn it better. It involves being social about it and getting information from other people who are teaching. So you're getting new filters, you're getting new paradigms, you're getting new metaphors, you're getting new analogies. It also means that there are times you go off on tangents and then you come back. That's the power of the social learning experience. When we give that to students, good things happen. By the way, at Harvard, at Boston College, at a couple of other schools on that list, in 1990, study groups were illegal. Science teachers said, if you join a study group, you're cheating and you'll get kicked out of school. Today, it's required. <laughs> you have to join a study group. If you know Matthew Lieberman's work, he is out of UCLA and he's done some work on the social brain. He has found some very interesting things when it comes to socialness and our lives. He has found, for example, that when you, have, uh, when, when you are connected to, to another person, you're actually using different systems of the brain. And as soon as you go to a task, you disconnect those systems and go on to something else. So if you have an experience, he's done this experiment over and over again, where he'll give students test questions, and then he'll ask them to talk to someone, and then test questions, then talk to someone. They literally change in the moment 
Test question, focus on the task. They disconnect, they come over and they talk. And they use two different systems of the brain. We have systems of a brain that are just for socialness. That's all they're for, is relegated to socialness. Now, he took this a little bit further, and he started to do some experiments around so, uh, socialness and pain. What he found was fascinating. He played this social game with people called e-ball, and here's what he did. He put uh, people into an fMRI machine so they could see what the brain was doing, and then he let them control this little hand right here, all right? He said, you are playing ball with two other people in the world. They see you like you see them. You don't know who they are. They don't know who you are. You choose who you throw the ball to. And so they let people in this fMRI machine start playing ball and, and choosing. They're going to throw it to this person. They're going to throw it to this person. They're going to throw it to this person. Well, something very interesting happens about two minutes into the experiment. Suddenly, the two friends that they're playing with, these two people who they've just met, Stop throwing the ball to you. This little hand doesn't get the ball ever again. Not once. And they found that within 30 seconds, this person starts to feel pain. It intensifies over the course of three minutes to the point where it is the same kind of pain as if you drove a nail through someone's bone. The part of the brain that controls pain senses social pain just like it senses physical pain. Now they thought that was fascinating and interesting and of course they wanted to make sure that that was accurate so they started doing some other experiments. You know what else they found? You know what can help you deaden pain from social things? The same thing that helps you deaden pain for physical things. These pain centers in your brain that are the same for both, the same thing works to fix them both. That thing is Tylenol. You can deaden social pain with Tylenol, just like you can deaden physical pain with Tylenol, because it actually impedes the receptors that are in the right part of that section of the amygdala, that section of the neocortex. You can actually deaden the pain. Socialness matters. We are wired to be social. I was standing up there during the last session, and I noticed that of the 40 to 45 people here, 40% of you were actively engaged in your phones or your devices. You were on them. I was watching you from behind you. I could see you. These are the same devices, by the way, that we ban in the classroom. We tell students, do not use those devices that have all the world's information on them. No, 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 put them away. I gotta teach you math. I've gotta teach you English. I have to teach you communication. Don't use this device that is so powerful you can find out any piece of information anytime if you know how to use it well. I'm not gonna teach you how to use it well. You figure that out on your own. Instead, I need to teach you how to add. Get out your pencil and paper. We've got a problem when it comes to the disconnect of socialness and education. It is important. We need it. We need caring. We need to feel connected. The third finding that I'm going I'm to bring up is the last one I'm going to talk about from the light study, although there are more. Please check it out on the website, the Harvard Assessment Series. But the last one is my favorite one of all. Richard Light asked people, what was your favorite class? What was your favorite class of all time? What was the favorite experience you had during your undergraduate experience? Not a single student said a lecture, by the way, not one. They said things like, it was the class where we had the mock trial at the end. It was the class where we fed the homeless. It was the class where we presented to the board of Macy's about a brand new marketing strategy that we'd come up with. They were the classes where there were no set answers and they had to figure out the problems and the solutions. They were the classes where the students got to be critical thinkers and creative thinkers and collaborate effectively. They were the classes that were unique, that were hard, that were challenging, that were service-based, that were challenge-based. These were the classes over and over and over again they said were my favorite. This led Richard Light to ask a really important question, by the way. I heard him speak once. He said, why aren't all classes like this? Isn't that a great question? So as we start to look at what that actually means, we look at constructivism, for example, and how you can create problems, challenges, service-based learning opportunities. As we create these constructivistic models, the flipped learning one is, is by far the most uh, press heavy right now. But they're all aspects of constructivism. As you start to look at that, think about what happens when you allow students to try something first. When I allow my students to use this simulation, and I say, I want you to see what it's like to have certain problems with the muscles of the eye, or certain problems with cranial nerve settings in the eye, I want you to be able to experience this. 
I can put this asset in their way. I can let them experience this in what, 20 minutes? Now think about that. How long would it take a person sitting in a clinic before they saw all of these problems come their way? Three months? Three years? Here I get to see it in 20 minutes. I can practice it over and over and over again. And then I can come back. I can take the quiz. I can look at some more theory. I can have a conversation about it with all of my peers. I can say what I found. I can see what they found. We can actually turn it into a learning, learning object, a learning moment. Because I put the do first. I want to play a, a quick video for you. I'm going to ask uh, Stan up there to, to push play on this. This is a man named Dan Meyer. And Dan Meyer was a science teacher. Uh, he then went on to Stanford, and now he's a Stanford lecturer. But he goes around the world talking to people about how to change the game in terms of education. Now, he put together a sort of what if, what would happen if Khan Academy gave a presentation about Angry Birds, and then he ties it back to science and math. In 90 seconds, you're about to hear what the flipped classroom is. This is pretty brilliant. You get the mouse to sit on the, there you go. Thanks. So maybe you've heard about this Angry Birds game and you want to know what it's all about. The first thing you want to do is download the app and then open the app. On the next screen, you're going to see a large button that says play on it. Go ahead and tap that button. Then on one side of the screen, you'll see a pig looking happy. On the other side of the screen, you'll see a slingshot with a bird who's angry inside of it. Pull that slingshot back on a trajectory that will hit that pig and explode it. That is the goal of Angry Birds. Now, after that, what we should notice is that, okay, wait, obviously Khan Academy would never lecture about Angry Birds, but what makes Angry Birds different from math and science? Angry Birds makes it easy to start playing, experiment, get feedback, and learn. I'm not saying lectures and explanations are never necessary in math and science or in Angry Birds for that matter. When I couldn't get past that one really tricky level, I went online and found a walkthrough. But the walkthrough, the explanation, wasn't the first thing I did when I experienced Angry Birds. So why does Khan Academy make an explanation the very first thing a student experiences with a new topic in math? When we put the explanation first, we get lousy learning and bored students. Now think about that paradigm for a moment, because almost every classroom I have ever set foot in tells first. We tell students what's important. We explain to them, you need to know this, you need to believe this, you need to buy into this. Now, go practice it later, rather than having students do first. Can I have you, uh, there you go. For years, what we have done is we have said, these are the best classrooms. Tell, show, do, review, ask. If you put those five things into your classroom, good things are going to happen. The problem is the majority, by far the majority, of what's going on in those classrooms is telling. We're not doing much showing, doing, reviewing, or asking. We're telling all over the place. I want to argue, and Dan Meyer would argue, we need to change this to do first. Do, show, tell, review, ask. I want to encode this in your brains. I want you to try to help each other with this. So here's what I'd like you to do. Please stand up and face one other person in the room. <laughs> now I would like you to please start marching in place. Marching in place. Now, one of you is going to say the word do. The other one's going to say the word show. Back to the first person to say tell. Back to the other person to say review and then ask and then keep going through it like a cycle, getting faster and faster and faster as you go. Go. Get faster. 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 All right, good, good, good. Have a seat, have a seat. Good job. We know, we know the importance of kinesthetic movement when it comes to learning, and yet for almost every person in our country, 
We stop moving and learning at about third grade. We know its value. We know how important it is. But about fourth grade, we say to students, sit in a row, shut up, I have to teach you something. Even though we know that's not the best way to learn. As we then move into what we know about the, the brain and actually cognitive science, we take that learning research and we start to explore what the implications are from the brain's perspective. Now, in this case, as we move from the 1990s, I'm going to jump ahead about 10 years, all right? In about 2002, so after 1992, we, we worked through some of that, we started to see education technology come onto the scene. And I really think that the, the question we started asking changed, and it got far, far worse, believe it or not. We started asking a worse question as we went through it. <laughs> it was not a good year for Nick, if you remember that. Uh, wasn't that in Florida? Wasn't he here somewhere? I don't know. But we started asking this question. What's the best way to do what I do on ground online? That's a horrible question. Because we're making an assumption about what we do on ground being great. And that just isn't always the case. And I'm going to see if I can't show you what some of that looks like. I have a question for you. Can you see the pattern? What do you see? Hide and seek. That's good. Does anybody see the horses? Two, three. Oh, there you go. Oh, I'm watching. Now, here's what people are doing. They're going like this. Horses. Oh, horses. What you just did was you engaged in something that our brains feel like, uh, make them feel like they're eating candy, all right? Your brain loves to pattern match. It loves to pattern find. Finding patterns is important. John Medina talks about this in his book, Brain Rules. I highly recommend it. If you haven't read it, go get it. The 10 things that we know, know we can replicate them over and over again about the brain. And he talks about ties to business and ties to education and ties to all a number of things. But he's a neuroscientist up in the Northwest. He actually works at two different universities. And he's the consummate professor. He talks about the power of pattern finding. Here's a game I play with my little girl. She's six. We play this game on the iPad, and she has to find the hidden object in the very, very messy room. So she has to find the flute, she has to find the thimble, she has to find the magnifying glass, whatever it is. She has to go look for it. That is pattern finding. Now, something interesting happens in your brain when you pattern find. When you find a pattern that you didn't know existed before, not only might it save your life, like in this case, but something happens in your brain that doesn't happen at any other time during your day you actually release two different hormones at the same time. You release endorphins and you release dopamine at the same moment. Now think about that. You are both relaxed and excited at the same time when you see a pattern that you didn't know existed before. That's pretty remarkable. That doesn't happen any other time during your day. When that happens, by the way, it is like your brain has lit up like a Christmas tree. It's like the 4th of July inside your head. If you look at it in an fMRI machine, the brain is just lighting up like crazy all over the different nodes. And not, I mean, you, you can see it. It's really quite remarkable. That is the time, by the way, to pounce. That is the time to exploit what is happening in that brain to help learning. Because you've got about a seven-minute window. And that seven-minute window is a time when you, there's heightened retention. You can learn faster. You can take it in and keep it longer. It is remarkable. But think about education. What do we typically do when students get the pattern? We go, oh, you got it. Congratulations. Let's take a break. <laughs> That's not the time to take a break. That's the time to go faster. That's the time to learn more. When you see the faces in this picture, your brain is lighting up like crazy. Are you seeing them? Now, I notice a lot of you are leaning forward because you want to see it. And as soon as you do, you sit back. By the way, there are 22 in this picture. I'll show you just a few. I see a few of you squinting. There's, there's six or seven of them. But these, these are just Bev Doolittles. You, you, can, you can see them online. These are pattern finding, and they're good for our brain. We know that when it comes to learning, pattern finding and pattern recognition should be baked into all of the curriculum. Yet if you ask a curriculum designer, if you ask a teacher, if you ask a professor, how much pattern finding and pattern matching do you have your students do, most of them will look at you like, what? I don't even know what that means. But we know this about the brain. Now, what I'm about to suggest to you is a little bit controversial. 
And I realize that some of this is, is grounded in perception, all right? We have two kinds of perception that we essentially work with all the time. We have internal perception. This is what we believe to be true about ourselves, about our ideas, about our beliefs. And then we've got external perception, what we believe about others or about others' beliefs. And these two things are constantly butting heads. I'm going to have you do a little exercise in a minute to kind of show it to you. But let me, let me show you an example. I'm going to give you a Venn diagram of the perception issues at my house. <laughs> I, I did stand-up comedy when I was in my master's program. That's how I paid for school. And um, I feel like I know funny. And so sometimes I will say to my wife, I'm really sorry, honey. I just can't turn it off. And she will look at me without missing a beat. She'll go, why don't you try? <laughs> oh, OK. That wasn't funny. Good. Uh, I want to show you this at work. I would like everybody to please think of your favorite ice cream flavor of all time. Don't tell anybody. Just keep it to yourself. Okay? Your favorite ice cream flavor. If you could only have one ice cream flavor the rest of your life, what would it be? All right? Now, I want you to turn to someone near you. I want you to give them a good once over, look them up and down. And then I want you to say, I'll bet your favorite ice cream flavor is and then tell them what you think it must be. But here's the important part. Tell them why. Why you said that. OK? Go ahead. No, that's, you can tell, you can tell them, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> perfect, perfect. All right, let me tell you what I just saw. I love doing this exercise, I love it. And I've done this exercise literally with hundreds of audiences around the globe. And I always find the same thing. Most of you, now I couldn't hear you, I don't know what you said. But I watched as you reacted, OK? And most of you did something like this. The other person said, your favorite ice cream flavor must be, blah, blah, blah. And then you went, <laughs> no, no, that's, that's not it. <laughs> that's what most of you do. However, in this room, I watched three people give my favorite reaction of all time. And in, in, in rooms like this, about three for every 50 people seem to do this. They say, your favorite ice cream flavor must be, and they tell them. And then the person does this. I'm pretty sure they're offended. <laughs> now, I don't know what was said, like chunky monkey <laughs> or vanilla. I think people don't like to be plain. I don't know. I don't know what it is. That is the difference between internal perception, what you believe about yourself, and external perception, what others believe about you. All right? What I'm talking about deals with that same issue. I think about, when I think about infusing education technology into the mix to help perpetuate what we know about the brain, I think of guys like Mark Edmondson. He's at Virginia. And he wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times last summer that basically said this. Can't we all agree that education technology just doesn't work? It's just not that good. It might be fine for shut-ins. It might be good in that sense. But we all know the ultimate end-all, be-all of education, the reason students go to college, the reason that they, that they come, the, the thing that we do that helps them the most, we all know that it's the lecture. That's what he said. That's why it, a good lecture can change lives, a good lecture can motivate, a good lecture can inspire. Now, please hear me. I'm all about the good lecture. I've polled audiences, thousands of people. I have asked them, how many good lectures did you have at your university? Most people will tell you three. And then when you say, how many good lectures did they produce? Most people will say, oh, about three apiece. Really? <laughs> Nine great educational experiences out of all 250 you had in your, in, in your college career? That's all you got? And most people will go, yeah, that's about right. This, to me, is not the end-all, be-all of education. But I'm not, I, I know that there are people that agree with Mark Edmondson. If you look at the, the uh, National Survey of Student Engagement, half of the students say that half of the time that they are in classrooms, they're being lectured at. That that's exactly what's happening in their classrooms. 50% of all educational experiences are lecture. And then I think about guys like Eric Mazur. Dr. Mazur is a physicist at Harvard. Now, he was actually voted Lecturer of the Year twice at Harvard. 
He knows his way around the lecture. He's entertaining, he's engaging, students love him. He's a great, he is a great speaker, I've heard him. He's really, really quite remarkable. But he noticed something. That even though he was having fun lecturing, even though he was really engaging the audience with lecturing, his students weren't learning anything. They weren't coming back with the information that he needed them to have. So he did what only a Harvard professor would do. He created a, an instrument that he hooked up to his students to see what their brain activity was during their week. Right? That's what you do at Harvard. I'm going to show you one. But trust me when I say, you, you go online and, and look at these. There are 70 of these pictures, and they all look almost identical. All right, Eric Mazur's students that all did this, they all look the same. Here is what he found that a Harvard student's brain looks like during a seven day process of their week. I would like you to pay very close attention to what happens to their brain activity when they go to, when they go to class. <laughs> they look dead. The only other time their brain acts like that is when they're watching television. In fact, if you want to see a lot of brain activity compared to that, look at what happens when they're sleeping. I think the most bang for your buck is to sleep in the lecture. <laughs> I don't know. Our brains do not work best in a lecture environment. It's fine in certain circumstances when you've got a very small period of time and you've got a lot of information that has to get out. There are times that a lecture is appropriate, but most of the time it's not. It is not the best. It is not the end all be all of education. If you want to look at how students learn best, words are not it. Medina has done this study over and over again. When you give people a list of words or when you speak words to them, and then you ask them again in three days, they will remember about 10% of those words. When you then ask them 90 days later, they'll remember about 3% of those words. However, if you show them images, if you show them pictures, even up to 2,500 at a time, after three days, they will remember 90%. And after 90 days, they will remember 66%. It is remarkable. Pictures trump words, period. That's how our brain functions. That's how our brain works. I want to I show you this at work. I'm going I'm to give you a test, OK? I'm going to show you some words, and I want you to memorize them. I want you to remember as many of these as you possibly can. I'm going to ask you for them in about three minutes, OK? So you memorize as many of these words as you possibly can. Go. And time. All right. What I just gave you was a declarative list. I gave you explicit pieces of information. I give you facts, all right? A list of words, dates, events, and equations. Those are, those are declarative pieces of information. Now, at the same time, I know that to augment that, to enhance that, to help you remember better, I should give you something non declarative at the same time. I should give you senses. I should give you context. I should give you a story. I should give you something that dovetails with that information. That's how we learn best. In order to remember, we actually need more information rather than less. That sounds counterintuitive, but it's right. Our brains put the declarative and the non-declarative together. What we're trying to do is take those, the, what's called visual indexing, when, when we get the information, we take the information, the content, and we take the sense element, and they go down the neural pathways of our brain until they get to the hippocampus. And then they actually part company. You've got the sense element in one part of the hippocampus, and you've got the content residing in the other part. And then in order to remember, you pull one or the other out, and suddenly they both come. It's kind of like a tandem bicycle. All right, That's how it works. In fact, I can mess with your visual indexing. Let me show you. I can screw around with what you, with what you have known your entire lives. I'm going to have you read a list of words here in just a minute. I want you to read them out loud. I want you to read them loudly. I want you to read them top to bottom as fast as you can. Okay, Really, speed is the key. Read them as fast as you can, out loud, top to bottom. But here's the key. Please don't read the word itself. Read the color. Go. It's not easy, is it? Yeah. I, well, my, my, by the way, I heard somebody screw up on word number three. And I loved whoever said, green, I mean blue. <laughs> I love that. This is the Stroop test. Any psychologist in the room, you've probably seen this in your lifetime. I am asking you to take two pieces of information that were encoded at roughly the same cognitive time, between the ages of three and six, 
you have known both of these things for a long time. You've known how to put a word together and you've known what colors were for a very long time. And I'm asking you to pull one out over the other and have them compete. That's very hard to do. That's visual indexing. We know how the brain works when we're starting to train neurons. If you look at an fMRI machine, when you are training a neuron, meaning you're giving people information in more than one way, you get a lot more activity and you get these neurites that start coming off looking to connect to other pieces of information. Whereas you have an untrained neuron, you have a piece of information that was given to you one time in one way, that neuron is probably going to die unless it finds something else to connect to. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. We are trying to put the declarative and the non-declarative together so that we have a better sense of the word. Now let's see how you did with that memory test, okay? If you agree with what I'm going to say, I'd like you to raise your hand. If the word candy was in the list, raise your hand. Good, I think almost all of you did. Yes, you're right. If the word car was on the list, please raise your hand. Put your hand down. The answer is no, good, good, good. And if the word sweet was on the list, raise your hand. No. The word sweet was not on the list. Here is what you did. You added non-declarative context to a list of explicit uh, words. You took a declarative piece of information and added your own non-declarative sense to try to make sense of it. Students do this all the time. When we send home a reading for them, they're filling in the gaps left and right. They're filling in the holes left and right with, with stuff that's right and stuff that's not right. We know about visual indexing. We know about memory. And yet we don't very often employ the rules of the road to get people to remember better, to learn longer, and to keep it in their sights. John Medina ended uh, his education section with this. As I was writing brain rules, it hit me. If you wanted to design a learning environment that was directly opposed to what the brain is naturally good at doing, you would design something like a classroom. <laughs> we learn best outside. We learn best when we move. We learn best when we're doing almost everything aside from sitting in a desk and taking notes. We know that about the brain. When are we going to start to use it? That leads to the last section, education technology. When uh, we, we jump ahead 10 more years, I think we finally start asking the right question. Nick's back and looking better than ever. What's the best way to learn? Not to teach, not to assess, not to deliver one thing in two modalities. What's the best way to learn, period? That's the question to ask. If you think about this, we've been, we've been doing certain things face to face for years that we've never thought about doing online. Let me show you an example of this. I would like everybody to please think of what you did to get ready to come here today. All right, whether you were at a hotel or wherever you were, what did you do to get ready to come here? Just think about that mundane list of things. Now, I would like you to tell the person sitting next to you what you did to get ready to come here. But as you tell them, I would like you to use the biggest, wildest, craziest facial expressions you've ever used in your life. Just absurd facial expressions, okay? Go. Okay, good. I saw exactly what I needed. I wasn't watching the teller. I was watching the receiver, the listener. I wanted to watch what your face was doing as the other person used crazy facial expressions. And for about half of you, you were laughing. Fair enough. The other half were doing something called mirroring. You were mirroring that person's facial expressions on a smaller degree back to them. Now, this is a good thing. I, I'm a public speaking teacher. I teach this to students. If you've got a crowd mimicking back to you your facial expressions, that's great. You've connected. If you're in an interview and the, and the person who's interviewing you is mimicking back to you facial expressions, that's good. You're connected. But look what happened in 2007. The New York Times reported that most communication in the workplace takes place over email and chat. It is no longer face to face. In 2009, the Wall Street Journal said, this is leading more and more Fortune 500 companies to ask if potential employees have taken an online class because they want to make sure that you know how to communicate in the modality that they use. And yet we don't require that for most students. As you start to look at what we can do through education technology, we can immerse people in simulation. We can put people into, into positions they would never be otherwise. 
We can give them the sense of what it is for someone to have a heart attack without giving somebody a heart attack. They don't have to be in the right place at the right time. We can add elements like the mixer where you learn language over Skype talking to people in the, the country where they speak that language. Not sitting in a classroom conjugating verbs. This is free, by the way. It's all about connection to me. Let me end with this. When you start talking about putting these things together, there is a mantra that Web 2.0 has come out with. It's, it, it's called Create, Consume, Remix, and Share. They've been t talking this for eight or nine years. Now keep in mind, we're well past Web 2.0. We're into Web 3.0. But the mantra was really cemented in this uh, video called Have You Been Paying Attention? When it started talking about all the change, the rapid change that's happened in our world, and it said, have you been paying attention to this? And it says, we have to give students, in fact, it said teenage students specifically, the ability to create, consume, remix, and share material with each other. Now, when that first came out, I used to follow a bunch of blogs. And one of the blogs that I followed was by a person called EduBlogger. We, to the very, very first EduBlogger, we still don't know if it was a man or a woman. We don't know if it was higher ed or K-12. We have no idea. They just sort of sat back taking pot shots at education. And I read EduBlogger whenever a new post came up just to see what they were saying. And EduBlogger did not like this video, which surprised me, but they didn't. And they said the reason was this. Educators have to teach students to be original, have original thought, do original work. Imagine a world where using other people's work to create your own was OK. We would never have gotten past the toaster to see the benefits of the microwave. We'd never have gotten past swing music to experience amazing original works like Elton John's The Lion King or other seminal works. I think The Lion King may give us a clue about who Edgy Blocker might be. But I thought about that. And I asked, is that right? Are we just teaching students through the use of technology today to plagiarize and cheat and steal? Or are we actually helping them be better students? And I really, really thought on that. But you know how as you're thinking about something and you get a song stuck in your head, you can't get, you know what I'm talking about? I, hear, I saw The Lion King, and I, I wasn't a huge Lion King fan, but I couldn't get that st stupid song out of my head. So I got out my guitar and I started to play it. I actually, I played the guitar. I just sort of put down the track, because I wanted to be able to play this. Now, I don't know if you remember this, it goes, can you feel the love tonight? Remember that song? Remember that song when it came out? 1996, when it came out. So I'm playing it, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about your blogger, and I'm playing it. And all of a sudden, as I'm playing this song, I hear something. I hear something that took place a little bit after 1996. Tonight, the break of dawn, dawn, tomorrow, tomorrow I'll be gone. And then I heard this. You're beautiful. Oh no. You're beautiful. And then I heard this. If I could, then I would. I'll go wherever you go. These were stolen. These songs on the radio were stolen from Elton John and the Lion King. I thought, oh my gosh, these are is right. They just took it over and over and over again. In fact, in fact, if you want to see this, never mind, I'll find someone like you. Adele won a Grammy for that. And she stole it from Elton John. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're right. This is accurate. And then, as I played it a little bit more, I kept trying to find some songs. I heard something that was really disconcerting to me. I kept going, and pretty soon, I heard a song that came out a little before 1996. I heard this. Harry Truman, Doris Day, Red China, Johnny Ray, Walter Richard. You know? Billy Joel. Of course. Elton John stole it from Billy Joel. Actually, that's not true, because you can go back a little before that. You can go back. And you can find this song came out the same year, but a little before. Richard Mark sang this. Wherever you go, whatever you do. He sang that at my prom. No joke. Now I, I, I kept playing, I kept playing. I thought, it can't be Richard Marks. It can't be Richard Marks. There's no way. I'm not going to let that be the case. So I played, and I played. I think we're alone now. It doesn't seem to be. I said, no way, it's Tiffany. I'm not going to let that happen. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't. I went back a little further. Went back a little further and I found this. We're not gonna take it. Nah, no, 
We ain't Twisted Sister. Dee Snyder wrote the most powerful song of all time. Everybody's copied it ever since. You know that's not true. I, I can't, couldn't let it in there. Couldn't let it in there. So I started playing around the song a little bit. Started playing around a little bit. And I just took out the, the guitar and I put in just a bass. Because I heard something as I was playing. Tell, tell me if you hear this as, as you play this. Something like this. Remember this? Came out in the early 80s. You hear just the bass? See the stone set in her eyes. You too. See the thorn twist in her side. That's right. Does, does that work? Is you too? Is that more acceptable that it could be you too that actually wrote this? Because it's not. You can actually go back before you two and you will find some bands like this one in uh, Sweden who wrote a very famous song from around the early 80s went something like this. Take on me. Do you know it? Take on me. Take me up. Go. Oh, OK. Uh, You can actually go before the 80s to one of the most monumental times in our, in our country's history. Whoa. Whoa, whoa. Let's try that again. Here we go. Journey. Right? Give me Journey. Oh, yeah. Get the lighter. <laughs> Here you go. Just a small town girl. Right? Living in a lonely world. Right? No, it wasn't Journey. It wasn't Journey. You can go back into the 70s. How about something that took place in the 70s? How about something like this? On your mark, it's set and go now. Got it. Just Laverne and Shirley. You all don't know Laverne and Shirley? Oh, all right. It wasn't Laverne and Shirley. It wasn't. How about this one? This one you might buy. This one you might buy. What about this? I find myself in times of trouble. But the pain comes to me. Does that work? Speaking. Now you're singing. This is, oh, this is your music? There we go. It wasn't the Beatles. You can actually go back to the 60s and you'll find this. When B.B. King sang, when the night has come. Remember this? And the land is dark. Yeah? All right, B.B. King, could he have written it? He could have, but he didn't. This chord structure, you can go back to the 50s, you can go back to the 40s, you can go back to the 30s, you can go back to Walt and Matilda, you can go back to the entire 1800s, and you will not find this. I got somebody back there, he wants so badly to say it. Who sang this? Or who created this? Taco Bell. In 1790, Taco Bell wrote a canon that you've all heard if you've ever been to a wedding. It goes like this. Da 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 That canon has been copied over and over and over and over again because our society understands the power of create, consume, remix, and share. As we start talking about all of the things that we can do, when we put neuroscience, learning research, and education technology together, we can change everything. We just have to try. Thank you very much for your time. I'll answer some questions. So um, we are. We actually have to tell you we have um, we have lunch that's upstairs, not down here. Okay, and um, so I'm going to ask Dr. Borden because this is the way. If if you guys, uh, I remember when we started planning this conference. John Schuler said. I'm comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and so when I talked to Dr. Borden, I said, you, this is the context of what we're doing, and, and I don't care how you accomplish it, as long as people think differently and behave differently about the things that we're talking about. So based on the fact that I know they have lunch upstairs, and I have scheduled after people have had a chance to get settled in um, kind of like a, 
a time of chat with you and, and Ed. Um, so we can have some conversation then. Are you able to do questions and answers now too? Anytime. Okay, cool. Does, do people have questions and an questions for Dr. Borden? Okay, great. Then let's do this and then we'll go up. <laughs> there, we, I know we're constantly learning more and more things and keeping up with it's hard, but these kinds of, of experiences hopefully get the word out so that teachers know what they don't know moving forward. Thanks, I appreciate that. So what, what kind of impact is this having in, in real sense in education? Is this being employed? Because it seems to be pretty easy, easily provable in real time to people. I mean, it's not, people aren't gonna resist it when you can show them over and over and over again how well it works. Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. The answer is it's not really being infused very much. And that is because I think there's so much politics that are in, invested in education. There are so many, uh, so much enculturation that has taken place before. This is a lot of change. There, you're asking people to do things that they uh, have never done before. Um, in fact, I can, I can show you what I'm talking about. Everybody take your hands and put them out like this. Put your hands together, clap them, rub them. Now fold them and put them in your lap. Look down, do you have your left thumb over your right thumb? Raise your hand. All right, you're our neat and tidy people in the room. Right thumb over left, right thumb over left thumb. Put your, put your hand in the air. These, these are our party animals, all right? Did anybody have both thumbs together? One, only one? Watch out for that person, psychopathic tendencies? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Absolutely none of that's true, none of that's true. You are wired to do that a certain way. Everybody try it again, touch your hands out, clap. Rub, now fold them incorrectly. How's that feel? Awkward, right? It feels, gro it feels gross, yeah, I don't wanna do it. That's what happened, that's what I'm talking about here for some teachers. They've never done this before. They've never seen this before. They've never interjected technology. They've never used brain science. This is not how they were raised. This is not how they were taught. And they don't know how to do it. We've gotta go through and systematically start to train people in the, in the best ways, the better approaches and give them that kind of professional development versus the professional development we often get in schools and in universities that is, here's a new process, here's a new piece of paperwork you have to fill out, here's what we do with financial aid. It, we should start talking about methods as much as we talk about anything else. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna, I've got, I'm keeping track of who you are. Did you have a question there? Go ahead. Oh, okay, all right, so then I have Jeff, then I have here. First of all, uh, thank you. It's this uh, always been an interest. Uh, I'm in business and the psychology and how you lead teams, how you motivate people. So first of all, it's been very interesting. Thanks. But within the context of business itself, as we uh, as we integrate some of these ideas out of the education, because we're still educating and leading those those people, um, any suggestions, any best practices, anything that uh, you could offer up that maybe we could take back. Yeah, uh, here, here's a very practical tool you can begin to use right now that you could take back to your office if you've got training that's going on. If you're trying to get people to remember something and they're having a hard time remembering it, headmagnet.com. Go to headmagnet, like head, and like a metal magnet, headmagnet.com. It uses spaced repetition. It uses what, something that is called the forget curve, or the forgetting curve, that Ebinger started to study back in the 1800s that actually talks about how quickly people forget something. There is a natural rate of decay for your memory. Everybody's is different. For some people it's seconds, other people it's minutes, other people it's hours. But as soon as you remember something, you are starting to forget it over time. What, for, what a head magnet will do is it will assess your forget curve. It will actually measure how quickly you forget things and then it will ask you what's important for you to remember. You write them in sort of a flashcard looking thing and it will pop them up in front of you on your screen at the right time based on how you forget. So you can actually change it so that you can remember something literally forever because head magnet will remind you on two minutes, at two days, at three days, at three weeks. Whenever it needs to remind you based on your forget curve, it will remind you and you can literally train people using a tool like that. Jeff, what kind of, what schools of education do you see as the most innovative? Because it seems to me that that's really part of our leverage opportunity is to change the way in which our teachers are being taught how to teach. Completely agree. 
Uh, I see, so locally, the University of Central Florida is really doing some remarkable things with regard to education technology and how they are beginning to infuse that into other aspects of the, the, the organization, and that includes the College of Education. Uh, uh, not locally, I look at places like Duke, you know, Kathy Ann Davidson is leading sort of a psychological effort back into the School of Education that's really, really good. Uh, University of Oregon, where Dr. Zhao currently is, he was the guy that used to be at Michigan State that developed that Chinese game. He has really transformed the University of Oregon's College of Ed program into something that is much more about problems, about constructivism, those sorts of things. Now keep in mind, these students have to get hired when they leave. And so there are still, there's still the problem of right the K-12 saying, I don't want you teaching methods we've never heard of before because we don't know how to deal with that. So there, there's got to be a bit of give and take here on both sides. But th there would be places to start. Good question. OK. Uh, one of the things you're going to have to face uh, in this is accreditation. And uh, right now, a lecture is given one credit per hour of lecture. And then anything that's like a laboratory type of situation that uh, is given either two or, two or four or three, three hours right. have to make the single credit. So right. how, how is that transition going to be made? It's an excellent question. Uh, the answer, I think, was given by the Department of Ed this year, or, I'm sorry, in 2013. They have finally accepted for financial aid, you can put in a program that is competency based. Competency-based education, which Western Governors University, some of you have heard of Western Governors, there are uh, eight or 10 states now that are involved in Western Governors. They have done a good job figuring out the competency model to a degree. They've gotten us started, but figuring out what those outcomes are, what those competencies are, rather than saying time equals learning. Because time, do you all know this. I don't have to even prove this to you. Time does not equal learning. Just because you put time in doesn't mean anything. Some people learn it instantly. Some people don't learn it with hours and hours of study. Time doesn't equal learning. Outcomes equal learning. Competency equals learning. So measuring the right things changes that. They are now able to give financial aid for programs that use competencies rather than seat-based time. Uh, it, and it's happening. They, in fact, the Department of Ed has said to me, I was at the meeting where they said this, in 10 years, they expect competency-based learning to become the norm that it will go away from seat-based learning and it will be time-based learning and it will be competency-based as the norm in higher education. That's interesting if that's really true and that's really coming. These tools are how we're gonna get there. But that, that's the place to start and it's, it's starting. I'm on the board of a, of a group called the Florida Council on Economic Education. Yeah. And what we do is we teach teachers to teach children uh, financial literacy. And we have a workbook, we have a teacher series, and what we now have is a stock market game. And the reason I tell you the story is that I, I viewed three underprivileged children working at the stock market game. And they wanted, they're given a hypothetical $100,000, and they wanted to, to see what they should buy with it. They wanted to buy Nike, the stock Nike. And they, they, we got them the, the annual report, we got them the proxy statement, and they were struggling, but they were learning to read. They were learning to read and understand what they were reading. Then they had to do the math, the earnings per share, and the percentage growth. And they came out as readers, and they came out understanding math by just that stock market game. Incredible experience, and they won the, the, the contest as well. What you've just described is called curriculum integration. And I am a big proponent of curriculum integration. There should not be situations anymore where we're only learning one discipline in a vacuum. Because life doesn't work that way. Life is connected. And so curriculum integration actually allows for people to learn things like poli-sci, so government, with finance, with math, with reading, start to put them together. You can also then start to leverage teachers together. When was the last time you saw teachers collaborating we don't give them that opportunity. We say, you teach your 30, stu your 30 students, your 60 students, your 90 students by yourself. Good luck. And so what do the teachers do? They say to the students, here's a group assignment. I'm going to give you a project, because I know that you're only in group 7% of the times in education, but yet you're in teams 78% of the times in the world. So here's your project. Good luck. They follow the same model. It's a horrible model. Collaboration is important. Curriculum integration is important. I couldn't agree more. Thanks for sharing that story. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, how do we save our students now? For, I ask this, because everything, because the world revolves around me for one thing, so it's about my son. He's 17, he's missed probably 
a third of his high school career because he just doesn't like going to school. And, you know, I, in my, in my faith in educational systems, very slim, so I don't really push him that hard. But I know he needs a high school diploma. He's very bright. I mean, he does play WoW and League of Legends and all that kind of stuff. And he knows all these different configurations and can lead and things like that. But, you know, your plan, he's, it's, it's gonna, not going to come into fruition until after he's already lost, so to speak. How, how can I save him now? Is there something that I can use sure. to make he, – he hates going to school. He just doesn't like it. So, uh, unfortunately, we've got a whole generation of students that are like that that hate school, that are bored in school, and we have said, that's okay that they're bored. We're okay with that. <laughs> and that's a shame, that's unfortunate, but that's sort of the reality that we're dealing with. There are now ways to suck them in, if you will, to trying things that they wouldn't necessarily try, to learning things they wouldn't necessarily learn without them even knowing it's happening. I would, I would recommend that you take a look at the work of Jane McGonigal. Jane McGonigal is the guru about games. She has developed a new game that has just come out that your son should start to play and see if he gets interested in it. I'll bet that he will. The intrinsic as well as intrinsic motivators that go along with gamification are tremendous. They pull students into a point. Here, here's a, here is a statistic and a fact that you cannot match anywhere else. In games, you fail 80% of the time and you like it. When does that happen anywhere else? You enjoy failing because you gotta try again. You gotta try harder, you gotta try again. You gotta try harder, you gotta try again. And so it actually intrinsically motivates people to continue moving forward. So the games that Jane McGonigal is working on is the first place to start. I would also start to look at some of the technology that we have, it's, for example, Lumosity. I'm sure you've seen the commercials if you don't play it yourselves anyway. Now, whether or not it's, it changes the brain is still a question. The science is a little fuzzy, but the notion that you are expanding your concepts, your, your ideological frameworks, that is, that is accurate. That can, be, that can be shown. So there are some sort of tricks that you can do to get in, in their way. That's kind of how I look at this. School, uh, learning is like an adventure. You're walking along a path, and what our job should be as, as educators, but it can also be this as parents, is to put learning objects in the way that students are forced to make a decision about. Do I trip over it? Do I pick it up? Do I walk around it? Give them that opportunity. Let them think, I want to, I want to look at this. I want to you know, take a look at it and see what it's like and then begin to use it or not use it. And then they will begin to do some learning. That, that's quickly how I would start to, to remedy that. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I find this all very interesting. I actually got my master's in education from Western Governors University at nice. the beginning of the competency model system. And I'm currently in a doctoral program in education leadership and policy. So all of this is very topical to me. Um, but I was wondering if you could just briefly speak to issues around common core and assessment. Because while common core, I think, um, is trying to get at the ideas behind that or trying to get at some of this, the assessments that have been put in place, I think, are hit or miss across the board. Um, so yeah. if you could speak to that. Very fair. Um, common Core, for, first of all, the, I, I just saw the, this study came out in, within the last month. I think only about 36% of people even know what Common Core is. So let me say, if you don't know what Common Core is, it is the new system that 45 of the 50 states have adopted in terms of the, uh, the standards that they're going to start teaching to. And they're all the same across the country. So first of all, in terms of Common Core itself, its goal was to, to provide more rigor. That was what they, that's the word they keep using. Now, unfortunately, that's a little bit of an amorphous term, a bit of an ambiguous term, but that is the claim by the Department of Ed, by Arnie Duncan and those folks, we are going to be more rigorous with Common Core. Okay, I appreciate the desire, I appreciate the goal. I think that's a, a great thing to try to attain. I don't know if they're going to accomplish it, but we'll see. In terms of how they assess Common Core, I know everybody was very frustrated with No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind was basically uh, what, what some people have called no test left undone, right? That you just test and test and test and test. Common Core is very likely going to see that accelerate. Common Core will likely be to tests, no, no Child Left Behind on steroids. More tests, more assessment, which I think is a shame because there are so many other ways to assess students. However, we are starting to see some cracks in the armor. PISA has really changed what, can, what you can do in an assessment. It has changed what assessments look like. 
when, when we start now to look at Finland and at Poland and at South Korea, they are tested about a third as much as American children are tested. And yet they're telling you we test too much. So we're, we're, we've got to start to find some sort of common ground. And this is where the Dr. Zhao's at, at the University of Oregon come in. And he says, look, in China, we have had common core for decades. And it has destroyed us. Because all that we have are good test takers. We don't have entrepreneurs. We don't have innovators. We don't have people who are satisfied with life. We've got to find ways to get both. Common Core's mantra is it gives the power back to the teacher and allows you to do all sorts of creative things. We're going to see, I'm sorry to say this, in the first three or four years, it's not going to happen. You're going to see more testing. Hopefully, at that point, people will get sick of it and they'll start moving back the other direction. But that's yet to be determined because that's all going to be, be uh, you're going to have to follow the money. And the US government's going to hold the money and say, if you don't do Common Core, we don't give you the money. And so people are going to do Common Core, and they're going to do the assessments so that they get more money. So we're going to have to break that cycle. So I have like two things. Um, one is when you're talking about, to me, uh, is, isn't it, you need a better teacher to be, to be able to be creative. It's a lot harder. And so I mean, I don't know if anybody else feels like this. I think that teachers should be something that we celebrate. And uh, so, so that's kind of, you know, during lunch, we're going to have some conversations. And so I want you to think about that. What do you want in teachers? What do you think about smaller classrooms? So we have that kind of discussion. Because notice that all of the things that we've done, he's talking about networking and connecting, which is exactly what um, Ed was sharing with us yesterday. Um, and, but you mentioned also UCF. And so um, understanding we're launching an incubator here. Um, High Tech Corridor works through UCF. We have a number of UCF people here. In fact, I mentioned to Blair, who's with FAN, oh my gosh, wouldn't this be cool? And she goes, he comes to our school. <laughs> um, but also, in tying that together with UCF and, and looking at higher education, UCF is now like one of the largest um, universities in the country. And from the uh, economic development aspect, UCF is the home of High Tech Corridor. They, I mean, they, they work highly with High Tech uh, Randy can tell you more because he knows that's what he does. But um, FAN, um, they have the, the number one incubator system in the whole country with eight incubators. Um, so isn't there, is there a tie into the cool stuff that UCF is doing with this, you know, more students, great economic, GrowFL comes out of UCF? You know, a bunch of these initiatives come out of that and they're doing cool stuff in education. So. Is, is there a different thought model and, and that's why they're moving in that direction? And is that, you know, and is that something that maybe we should be looking at for our other universities? Uh, what, there's a lot to say, I'll I tell mean, you about but that. But it's like, it's like there's yeah, a whole yeah. context there yeah. of some interesting things that, that you threw yeah. out because Let, it was the only, every place else was what, you know, other places right. in the country, but we actually have somebody who's teaching like you're talking about, right. teachers to educate here. Let, I think that's Let me suggest this. That. Amanda Ripley, in her book, The Smartest Kids in the World, she went around and looked at uh, Finland, Poland, South Korea, some of the top performing nations in terms of the PISA and some of these other exams. And she found that there were some really significant differences between how they approached education and how we approach education as we continue to fall down that ladder. One of those things is exactly what we talked about. They only bring in, especially like in Finland, they bring in the best for education. It is hard to get into those programs to become a teacher. In fact, most of the teachers there, it took them three tries to get into a college of education so as to become a teacher. When was the last time you heard about that here? Because here's what I often hear. I couldn't get into med school, so I went into teaching. I couldn't get into engineering, so I decided to become a teacher. It's like a fallback position because anybody can get in any time. That's an issue. So as you start to think about what UCF is doing, um, they are really coming at it and saying, let's teach these folks methods. Because that's another problem with our education system. Teachers have no more than two methods classes before they go into K-12, and in higher ed, they have zero. They are not given information about how to teach unless they happen upon it naturally or a school is particularly progressive in their professional development. Most are not. 
So UCF is coming along saying, here are the teaching practices that we want to embody. If you want to teach for us online, you actually have to go through this process and we stamp you as certified before we'll allow that to happen. Not a lot of schools do that. And then in their teacher ed programs, they're doing some similar things by saying, here, we're going to teach you more methods because we're going to teach you some computer methods. We're going to teach you some psycholo psychological methods as well as just the typical process methods that you'll learn. So it's not just teaching about classroom management. It's about architecting experiences for, for students. That's really the difference in paradigm at some of these better schools like Duke, University of Oregon, UCF, some of those places. And, but for you guys, I think it's really significant to note that if you look at our sponsor list, it does. It says Florida High Tech Corridor, Florida Virtual Entrepreneur Center, Grow FL, the incubator project that we're working on. Um, so that, that um, the Florida High Tech Corridor is our sponsor, but they work with the University of Central Florida, and that's where, um, that's where our 1099 goes so that we got paid. <laughs> they sponsored this event. Um, and I think that that, is, that should be commended. I mean, so if you would give a, a round of applause and thank you. Um, because obviously they're, they're putting their money where their mouth is and we get to be connected with that and through the university system here. And, um, and I think that ties in for me personally and looking at what they're doing in incubators and growing business.